idea of living the atonement, there's a lot of assumed knowledge for that about what the atonement is. So my proposal for tonight is that we're going to talk or touch a little bit on, on history, on the atonement. We're going to look at the importance of the subject of the atonement. We're going to, probably the bulk of it, we'll be looking at the foundation principles, what I'm going to call the five W's of, of what, why, where, who and when of the atonement. We're going to briefly touch on the three main views that have developed over the years. Uh, and, and you'll understand why as we go through the next uh, classes, it's essential to see these things because they're going to come up in the next few classes as well. So good to touch base with them now. And then if we have time, we want to look at the principle of the atonement as it was seen in the life of the Apostle Paul, just briefly, and uh, then we'll just see how, how we're going for time as to whether we deal with anything else. So let's just, let's just start um, with, with a few words on the history of this subject in our own days, sort of in my lifetime. And uh, some of you have lived longer than me, so we'll, we'll go back probably to the uh, age that some are here in, in the audience. Because it's such an important subject, so important that it gets dealt with and as a result has been the cause of many, many ecclesial upheavals. Okay, so the Brotherhood has often been turned upside down on this topic ever since the days of Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts, probably on average every 20 years. Now, when I first did this series, of course, um, the recent upheaval was, was in the 90s. But of course, since then, some of you younger ones will have been exposed to the idea and the doctrine of theistic evolution and that impacts majorly on the doctrine of the atonement and, and we'll touch on that at some point during uh, our series and uh, well how's that lived in your life if you believe that as opposed to the truth as we know it um, but many of you in this room as well would be quite painfully aware of how this subject gripped our city in the 1990s and uh, the air became quite tense ecclesias were on tenterhooks individuals were emotionally wrung out and of course in our ecclesia here uh, we had uncle john martin and and he was being accused of false teaching and and so we took a stand and uncle jim luke down at cumberland and of course that went through most or much of the 1990s. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember when the same subject gripped this city and others in the 1970s. Uh, between ourselves here and in Brisbane with the Petrie Terrace Ecclesia up there and Brother Herbie Twine, uh, the 1970s saw this such, so that's about 20 years before. And then some of you may be even old enough to remember, I was born in the 70s, but I don't remember that, but I, I wasn't born in the, in the 50s, I don't remember this at all, but some of you may be old enough to remember the 1950s when there was reunion between Shield and Central here in this country. Um, it was predominantly peaceful the reunion, but there was uh, a few, the old paths, and uh, a brother by the name of P.O. Barnard, who, who took uh, a stand against reunion and separated. And of course, we have um, the Unity booklet as a result of that, uh, dealing with the time that Brother John Carter was out here and Brother Cyril Cooper who 
were the representatives of the magazines back in the UK, which had already come together and reunified. So, so can you see that this is something that, you know, probably when was the Eastic Evolution really rocking this city? You know, in the 2010s through to the mid 2010s and maybe still have um, some tail going on at the moment. So, you know, in 20 years time, this is going to come again because each generation has to go through it for themselves and learn it and understand it and see it. And of course, there's been many, many articles and talks given on this subject. And for my uh, own personal history, we had in this ecclesia Uncle John, who year on year gave a talk on the atonement, normally at the end of every year. And he refreshed us and reminded us on the importance of this subject. And I could probably tell you that talk off by heart. But now that I'm getting older, I know where the book is and I can go to the book and I can read Uncle John. He's got his talk written out in a book that he published in the 1990s. I was thinking about this. I was thinking, Uncle, Uncle John, I probably was impressed on this subject by him from the age of about 16 to 20, 16 to 21, somewhere around there, about five years. And I worked out he's 40 years older than me, so that would have made him around 55 to 60. 55 to 60, and I consider that, you know, some of the best talks I've ever heard. So I was thinking Uncle John, uh, on this subject, and on many subjects, was giving his probably best talks in that time bracket of 55 to 60. Um, so a major impact on my life at that time. So you young ones, if you are here tonight listening to this, and some of this is, is new, don't, don't just park it and leave it, revisit it and revisit it and revisit it, because principles are hard to continue to remember. And particularly on the atonement, some of the language and terminology can be sometimes confusing depending on who's speaking and the perspective that they're speaking on. You, you need to get this under your belt. And the earlier you do it, I think the better off you'll be. So Uncle John was a great mentor for many of us here in Enfield as a result of that. Now the way in which most talks on the atonement would go would be you would start in Genesis 3 and you'd end up in Romans or, or Hebrews and you'd start with the problem outlining what the problem was and then the solution. Now of course I've read most of the articles and done talks much along those lines but something caused me to change tack in the early 2000s just share a little story as to how this all came about, this particular series on the atonement. So the upheaval here in the 1990s spread to the UK. And I was living over in the UK at the time. So you, you were going through difficulties here uh, in the early 1990s. And, and it wasn't too long. And it spread to the UK in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. And ecclesias were divided, split down the middle torn apart, Bible schools split, broken up. And of course, since then, in recent years, it has now spread to North America. And some of you may have friends or even family caught up in the upheaval between amended and unamended fellowships over there. It's really essentially the same discussion and the same problem. The primary difference between aspects on the atonement but back in the early 2000s, I attended a youth group camp on the book of Ruth. And it's a great subject for young people, the book of Ruth. And we had discussion book and there was notes. And so the young people were already familiar with the book of Ruth. So the committee came and asked two brethren, myself included, would we do a subject that was similar or along the lines of the book of Ruth, but not actually do the book of Ruth? Well, what better subject than to deal with redemption? Redemption. Ruth's all about redemption, and so we did redemption in Christ. Now, the other brother got the easy part. He had 
the problem and the solution. So it's sort of like done. And uh, I got given the application. Oh, how do I do this? You know, I thought the atonement was just really theory. You just go through the principles and that's the atonement. I got given the title, the application. What I discovered was that I could actually teach the young people on that occasion more about the subject of the atonement if they saw a direct correlation between the principle and the practice. And that's really the crux of this. It may be hard to remember the principles, but I guarantee you, during this series, when you see the practice that comes from the principles, you'll never forget the principle. And every single principle, whether a right one or a, or a wrong one, has a practice that comes out of it. Now, of course, um, I got accused of false teaching on that occasion too, and barred from speaking from certain me meetings as a result. Um, didn't even get a chance to, to write and say. They heard the talks and said, right, stop. So it's a very important subject as a result. So here's fundamental point number one. I've, I've already alluded to it, but let's put it not moving so let's see why okay doctrines and morals fundamental point number one every doctrine has a moral application there's a moral force behind every teaching in the Bible, or any teaching, as a matter of fact. It doesn't have to actually be in the Bible. Whether it's a right teaching or a wrong teaching, there will be a practice, a moral force, a moral power that comes out of that principle. Doctrines are not intended to stay as doctrines. They must be lived and it's a, it's a general principle in society, in life. You live what you believe. And, and that's why propaganda is such a powerful tool. You live what you're taught, what your, your belief system is. So right doctrine, and of course we're talking about the Bible, so we're talking about doctrines and teachings. Right doctrine ought to lead, it doesn't always, but ought to lead to right practice. But equally, wrong doctrine usually leads to wrong practice. Now, now it is possible, and you're going to see this as we go through our series, and some of you may sort of think, oh, I didn't know. I thought I believed the right doctrine, but what I've been doing has been the wrong practice. It is possible to subscribe to right doctrine, but to be living wrong practice. And it works on both sides. You know, we send our children to school to learn, to understand principles and methods of mechanics, mathematics, science, so that when they leave school, they can put those principles into practice in the workforce. You spend all of that schooling, all those school years learning the principles. Why? So you can put them into practice. Now, I know some of you might think, well, when did I ever put trigonometry into, into practice? You know, or some of those aspects of, uh, of science. Well, it depended on what career path you took, but your schooling years became essential for whatever job you eventually got or are seeking to get. The same is about, true about your children at home. You teach your children about the issues of life. You don't have to teach them maths and science. You leave that to the school teachers. But you do need to teach them about the issues of life. Why? Well, one day they will leave home too. And when they do, you want them to take what you've taught them and put it into practice. Because you will live what 
you know. So that's why we've called this series. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. It's going to come up on every single slide all the way through living the atonement in daily life. And I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's actually a crucial sentence because it has two parts to it. I remember going doing this at a, an ecclesia. Uh, I can't remember where it was. I think it was uh, overseas uh, in New Zealand. And they had a banner and the banner was too short to put the title on. And it was living the atonement. And I got up and I said, it's important about having this whole title. It sounds a mouthful. And, and of course, the next time I gave to give the talk, they'd written in daily life in a pen underneath. And the reason is, is because take the first part, living the atonement. So here's a doctrine and it has to be lived, not debated, not argued over, not preached about, not questioned. Some of those things are necessary to get to an understanding of it. But when it comes to the crux, it's really about living the atonement. That's when you've got an understanding of it, when you live it. So living, not debating and arguing, but living the atonement is crucial number one. But how often do you have to live it? Well, not just on Sundays. Not just when I feel like it. Not just once a year at Easter or Christmas, as many religions around do. Nominal Christians. I don't have to go, I just live this, this doctrine on these two days of the year. Or like Israel, on the Day of Atonement, one day in the year. No, it's living the atonement every waking moment, every single day. That's the real purpose of the atonement. So when he talks to you here on the principles, you know, going through the problem and then hearing the solution, isn't meant to be just left at that. It's to be taken and lived daily. And I hope we see this powerfully demonstrated over the next few weeks. So let's just now spend some time looking at the principles of the atonement as we will use this as a, as a bit of a springboard. There'll be terminology here, there'll be phrases, there'll be ideas, there'll be uh, principles that will outline, all of them will come up during the next four classes. Now, I think it's uh, fairly fair to say that there are two main big doctrines of the Bible, okay, encompassing all scripture. The big one, the number one doctrine of the Bible would have to be God manifestation. It's God's purpose with the earth, the reason he created it. And of course, you can identify the quote there, I'm sure all of you from a young age will know what that quote is all about and where it comes from. Okay, Numbers 14 verse 21 or Habakkuk 2 or a number of places actually, but we, used, we usually use Numbers 14 verse 21. God wants to fill the earth with his glory. The all-powerful creator wants to fill the earth with his glorious being and character. Now, of course, we look at that and say, how is that possible? How is that going to happen? If that's the number one doctrine of the Bible, it's got no hope of succeeding without number two. Because the atonement is the integral part of God's purpose with the earth of making it succeed. The atonement is God's method by which the first doctrine will be a success. God's plan of salvation for mankind is the hinge by, or, or, or the, uh, the fulcrum point by which the first doctrine can ever 
be succeeded, uh, be, be successful, I should say. So put that somewhere, tuck it away in your, in your Bible, young people. Two main doctrines. Now, many other doctrines come under those headings, of course, but they're the umbrella of the scriptures. So when we talk about principles, foundation principles of the atonement, what are we looking for? Well, I'm not going to answer all these questions right now. Uh, they'll get answered during tonight and over the course of the next four classes because we want to really zone in on aspects and tease out the moral force behind some of these points later on. So, so you'll get more about this as we go through. But what would you put for the answers for some of these? Th these questions here, there's probably more as well. These questions here, the answers to these questions here are unique among Christadelphians as opposed to every other religion. I, I don't know of any other religion or any other fellowship to a certain extent within the brotherhood itself who has the same answers to all these questions. We're, we're trying to seek and search what these principles are because each one will have a moral force behind them. What was the nature of Adam at creation? What was the punishment for sin? Th those two there, uh, you know, for young people, you've probably had to grapple and go through those things with theistic evolution because they become knocked over from what we've always said, the answer to those two there, with the doctrine of theistic evolution being introduced. What is our nature now? Did it change after the fall? That's a question to answer. Then there's, you know, attention to Christ. What's the nature of Christ? And of course, the churches out there say that he's very God of very God and very man of very man. And they fudge the whole thing. Well, what do we say? What did God require of Jesus Christ? How did Christ fulfill that requirement? Now, and these last two here. Um, will come up, another strand of the atonement that's taken a pathway over the centuries um, is the one that affected us in the 1990s. The answers to those two questions. How did that benefit the Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, how does that benefit us? So I'll leave that just there for now. I want to sort of just deal with the problem and the solution in a very simplified way. Uncle John would spend the whole night doing this, okay? Um, we're going to just spend a portion of the night doing this, but I think we'll get enough information and understanding of the principles to be able to take that with us into the following classes. So let's start with the problem. Well, that's fairly easy to identify, isn't it? God said, and this is Sunday school stuff here, God said, if you disobey my one command, you will be punished with death. Pretty straightforward. Disobedience leads to death. Okay, tuck that away. That's point number one. Disobedience leads to death. Now, of course, I know there's more to it than that because inevitably it meant also that there was a physiological change in Adam as well as a change in his relationship to God. He became a dying creature with a bias towards more disobedience. The first disobedience would not be the last. Once he sinned, he would now have a bias to continue sinning. There, there, there was a change in him that took place. And he was now dying. He was mortal. But he also was separated from any fellowship with God. And, and of course, we know that God 
drove him out from the garden, drove him from the presence of the Elohim, the angels. Okay, so, that, so there's those two consequences. He became mortal with a bias towards sin and he was now separated from any fellowship with God. There was enmity. This word enmity, you, you remember, it means extreme hatred. There was now enmity that existed between God and man. Man was in a hopeless situation and he, the man, could do nothing about it now. His opportunity for that had gone. He sinned, so he has to die. Simple as that. But we know that God never wanted to leave us like that. Never wanted mankind to stay like that. We couldn't provide, Adam couldn't provide any solutions, but God could, and he did. So that's what I want to say about the problem. I think most of that, all of us, would have a fairly good handle on. We hear it in lecture after lecture and in Sunday school and first principles. That's the problem. How's God going to fix it? What's the solution? We'll come to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. This is what Paul says in Romans. And of course, Romans chapter 1 to 8 is probably the go-to section in the Bible to understanding all of the ins and outs of the process of the atonement the salvation, God's plan of salvation for mankind, Paul methodically goes through all of it in this section on Romans chapter 1 to 8. And here in chapter 5, I know it sounds a little difficult, the language here, in verse 17 to verse 19. I'm just going to read it and tell you what it means. Okay? For if by one man's offence, death reigned by one. So sin came as a result of one person. He actually says that back in verse 12 as well. Verse 17 again. For if by one man's offence, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. So an individual singled out here and another individual is singled out here. Just, just take that on board for the moment. Then verse 18 says this, Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So therefore, he says in verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now what the apostle is doing here, he's showing the process by which sin and death entered into the world. And then what he's saying is that the process to go back to what Adam lost is reversed. It has to be reversed. So let me put it here on the screen. And I've called this the maxim of the atonement. Understand this, you will get a long way to understanding the ins and outs of the atonement. If disobedience brought death, Paul is saying... That only obedience can bring life. All right? so it's, a, it's a reversal of the process. If you go down a one-way street, okay, the only way to get back to where you were is to reverse and go the other direction. Adam sinned. It brought death. Christ was obedient. It brought life. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. When you put it like that, I know the language there. You may want to go and read another translation. The ESV helps in this regard. Some of this language in chapter 5 particularly is quite challenging in the authorised version. So maybe write that next to Romans chapter 5. And then if you want to also put down Romans 6.16, you can see the same principle, which is in the next chapter, 
Where, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Okay? One's going down, the other's coming up. It's a reversal. So it's important to remember this, I think. Now, we just want to unpack this a little bit more. What are we saying? We're saying this. That if Adam was made very good, but his disobedience changed him to become now mortal dying, and I'm putting those two words together, by the way, because some people don't see a difference between mortal and dying. This will come out later on, but some think that uh, mortal is different to dying. It's not. Mortal means to be deathful. It's an Anglo-Saxon word. It means to be deathful. It means to be dying. Okay, so Adam was very good, but his disobedience made him mortal dying. If you're going to reverse the process, and the only way is to go backwards, it has to start with someone who is mortal dying, but then is obedient and can change back to being very good. All right. you, you can't cheat the process. That's what Paul's saying here. You can't cheat the process. He says in Hebrews chapter 2 that it was impossible for an angel to do this because that would be cheating the process. The process has to start in reverse with someone who would be mortal dying, but then show obedience to the full, and that would bring life. Well, actually, the process would be reversed to being very good. But Paul in Romans 5 actually says God's taking it back past very good. Okay, so it's, it's, it's going even further back. It's going to eternal life, something Adam never had. But that, that's not our subject for tonight. Okay, so someone that's... Mortal dying, but obedient is the beginning of the process of reversal. Well, that doesn't help much, does it? I mean, obedience is now an impossibility to all humans. Has been since the first sin. And anyway, it would only help that one person who was obedient, wouldn't it? No one else would benefit if you kept the... Uh, reversal process. Only those that are obedient would receive life. Well, you see, God introduced a marvellous solution, like just incredible, glorious, Uncle John would say. And it was. And all the clues are found in Genesis 3. So, so come back to Genesis 3 and put your shelves for, uh, y y yourselves for a moment in the shoes not that they probably wore any, of Adam and Eve. Okay, so we've dealt with the problem. We know what the problem is. I don't think we need to investigate that further for now. So that's verse 1 to 6 of chapter 3. Verse 7 shows how Adam and Eve tried to solve their problem themselves. See verse 7, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They used a man-made solution. They tried to solve their problem using fig leaves. And as with all man-made solutions, it, it, it came up short. Given time, what would happen to those fig leaves in a month or so? Dry, shrivel up, fall off. Huh. Back to square one, aren't you? So, so their solution was a very temporary solution. It was one that needed constant attention. And it never dealt with the core issue of disobedience. You see, if it just meant kept, you, you kept on putting fig leaves around you, you didn't need to be obedient to do that. You just need to have a ritual set up whereby once a month you went and cut down more fig leaves and covered yourselves with fig leaves. 
It didn't address the issue of disobedience. Paul says the reversal process is needed. It needs to start with obedience that leads to life. The, the, the fig leaves here, brothers and sisters and young people, didn't fit the criteria that only obedience can bring life. So, so God introduced a little lamb, one that he provided. So we find this out in verse 21. And it's just snuck in here. It's a very small verse, but it's got powerful implications. It's called the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world in Revelation. But it's just snuck here in verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did Yahweh Elohim make coats of skin. Now it's, it's singular there, it's not plural, it's only one skin. There was only one lamb, a little lamb had it. It's skin removed and made into two coats, two garments. And God clothed Adam and Eve with the skin provided from this little lamb. So there's, there's three points, I think, that come out of this. Point number one. Point number one is that God said, Adam and Eve... You will have no contribution in making the solution. It's out of your hands. You can't do anything about it. You can only watch from the sidelines. It will not come from any effort from you. Only I, God, can provide the solution. And, and then what he did is he killed the lamb right in front of their eyes and covered their nakedness with it. Nakedness is a symbol for sin. He covered their sin with a coat each of them from the skin of that lamb. Now, we might shudder at the thought of that. It seems so heartless and cruel, doesn't it? This little lamb hasn't even had a chance to live, really. But you just imagine if you were Adam and Eve watching that. You've never seen anything die in your life. You don't even have any comprehension of death. It would have made a powerful, lasting impact, wouldn't it? And the clear message of that scene happening in front of their very eyes must have been, and I remember Uncle John saying this time and time again, that life could only come through death. Oh, sorry about that. That's the quote on the bottom there. I thought I had it already up. The slain lamb. Life could only come through death. All right, I've got that in big, bold letters in my Bible and in my notes here. That was what they were being taught as they watched that scene unfolding. And not just any death. It wasn't a, a you know, a you, an old lamb or sheep i should say you know in its mutton years um about to die of old age and so oh, that's okay no this is a young lamb it's not just any death the lamb was killed it was sacrificed it was slaughtered it gave up its life to benefit adam and eve so that they could live so here's point number two. Point number one, Adam and Eve, you can't do anything about it. I'm going to provide the lamb. Point number two, only a sacrificial death can bring life. As they watch that scene unfold. A sacrificial death that they had to personally connect to. They had to wear the coats from its skin. There had to be a personal acceptance an involvement in that, with, with that sacrificial death of the little lamb. They had to identify with that lamb. They had to witness it and be associated with it. Now, I think many sisters here tonight would, would faint to see 
an animal killed like that and then skinned in front of their eyes and then told to wear that skin. There's no t tanning process that's taken. It's not leather. Still got bits of hair and blood still on it, okay? And I dare say at that point, many brethren would faint too. I'm not wearing that. I mean, just the thought of it. But Adam and Eve watched in awe, swallowing hard, yes, but taking it all in. This was the only way back they'd been taught. They would now look like that lamb. They were clothed like a lamb, as if they'd gone through that sacrificial death too. Now, think about the marvellous way God did this. Okay, you see what's happening here? Adam and Eve are now clothed with the lamb. It's still just one lamb though. That lamb clearly would represent them before God. So that means more than just one person would benefit from, from this sacrificial death. Now, you may remember that just a little bit before we went to Romans 5 and we said, only obedience leads to life. Well, here in Genesis 3, we've just seen that Adam and Eve were being taught only a sacrificial death leads to life what's that saying but well, i'm going to tell you that that means they're saying the same thing within the brotherhood and we'll i think it's talk number three that this comes out in the brotherhood there are some who would like to say no no they are two separate things there's obedience that is necessary and there's a sacrificial death. Well, don't you think that God would make that clear here in Genesis 3 and put those two things? Or Paul would make that clear? Paul is saying the same thing as Genesis 3. They are the same thing. We'll have a look at the practical implications of separating those two in, in talk, I think it's three, later on in the series. But the real point here is that true obedience involves sacrificially dying. You can't be obedient with a sacri without a sacrificial death. The two go together. You cannot have obedience demonstrated if there is no sacrificial death. Because the sacrificial death is the ultimate proof of obedience. They go together like hand and glove. They're inseparable. And then the final point out of this is that clearly Adam and Eve still died. So the lamb was obviously unable itself to reverse that process. So the lamb, therefore, is just a symbol. It's a parable of what God intended to do by providing a mortal man who would be obedient by sacrificially dying. And that would refer, reverse the process of death to life. Not just for himself, but for any who are personally connected to his sacrificial death in the correct way. They wear him. All right, and, you, and you get that all here just from Adam and Eve watching that lamb die. And thinking, what does that all mean for me? Now, of course... The little lamb represented one man, and that man, of course, was Jesus Christ. He was provided by God. He was obedient his whole life up to and including his very public sacrificial death. And that's why he was raised and given eternal life. But not only does he benefit, so does anyone who associates with his obedient life and his sacrificial death and are willing to be clothed with him they lose their own identity they choose to be called christ see still just one man but there are many under that umbrella he's a representative of many others if 
they so choose. So, problem, solution. So let's just answer these five W's that I mentioned earlier from what we've considered so far, and maybe there might be a few more things that will, will come out of this. I, I guess the first question that might spring out of this, Adam and Eve looking at this, thinking, well, okay, I get that life can only come through death, but why? Why did it have to be a sacrifice? Why can it be something else? Why did it have to be a, a sacrificial death? A brutal demonstration of life being taken so quickly and so shortly. Well, as it says on the screen, the reason it had to be a sacrificial death is because that's the best and only way to deal with sin. You have to kill it. There is no sweeping it under the carpet, putting it in the corner of the room, shutting the door, walking away and just, just leaving it buried. You have to deal with sin. Sin had crowded out God from the minds of Adam and Eve. There was now a conflict between God's thinking and man's thinking, the serpent's thinking that was now in man. There's this bitter struggle. There's a battle going on. And in any battle, there's only one victor. It's a fight to the death. There's an enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's only one victor. There's not possible for the two to coexist. The serpent had to be crushed. Sin had to be destroyed. Now it's painful. Adam and Eve watching that would have had their gut wrenching. Right? Swallowing hard. It's ugly. It's unpleasant. But it's the only way, says God. And, and that's why God demonstrated it like that so starkly before Adam and Eve. The only way back to life would be through death. Now, of course, Uncle John loved using these three quotes. He put it into that nice, neat chart, you'll remember, okay, which is in the book uh, that he published, Saved by His Life. But notice the language of what has to happen to sin. All through scripture, you'll see the only way to deal with sin is to destroy it, is to condemn it, is to slay it. So that's why fig leaves weren't very good, were they? They didn't deal with sin. They didn't remove sin. Instead, they actually cloaked it. They disguised it. It was temporary. The fig leaves fell off. Sin got exposed again. It doesn't acknowledge the enmity. It acknowledges the shame, yes, but not the hatred, not the pain, the struggle, the, 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 the battle. Fig leaves don't do that. Maybe in your notes you could write down Colossians 3 verse 5. Mortify, therefore, the old man, the deeds of the flesh, the works of the flesh. Mortify means to cut off. And in that chapter, Paul is talking about you can only live either in heaven or on earth. You can't live in two places at once. You must choose one or the other. If you want to be in heaven with Christ, in those places with God, and Christ, you have to mortify the flesh, the works of the flesh. Or maybe write down Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll hold to the one and despise the other. You can't love both. It's God or sin. We looked at this. What type of sacrifice? Well, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. Because the only way to destroy sin was to conquer it. And the only way to conquer it is by not giving into it. That's the only way you can overcome sin, is by not doing it. That's a true victor. Who? Who could accomplish such a thing? 
Well, this phrase is going to come up quite a lot. Okay, this becomes quite an important word. We need to understand what we mean when we say this word. We believe the atonement on the basis of representation. There are other versions, and we'll look at those next class. Let's just get a bit of an idea as to what we mean here. A representative man, that's who? One that God would provide, but he had to be a representative of us with all our problems, okay, with all our susceptibility to COVID and all the sicknesses and the illnesses that, that come our way, all the pains and the ailments, all the pressures of life, all our weaknesses, but he had to at the same time be a representative of God with all of God's strengths, God's perfect characteristics. The two of them, the two aspects were brought together in one man. He was a representative. He was involved in all our weaknesses. Have you ever thought about why did Christ have to suffer so much? I know the churches out there say, oh, because it was to pay the penalty of sin. And so they graphically portray all the beatings and the lashings and the crown of thorns going on his head and all the spitting and the shame. This is just the crucifixion, by the way. But more than that, what did he have to experience and and suffer came from a poor family, it would seem. He was on the run right from the word go, running down into Egypt. He went and was brought up in Nazareth, a backwater, no university education. He had no home or personal space of his own. He was continually ridiculed, even by his own family. He received harassment. He had little sleep on many occasions. He was physically persecuted. He was abused. And then he suffered the most distressing death possible. Crucifixion is said to be one of the, if not the most painful death ever. Why? Ever thought about why? Why couldn't it just been a sword done quick? Why did he have to go through all of that? Because he's a representative of every single human being that has ever lived, brothers and sisters. So that no one of the human race at the judgment seat can say to the Lord, well, you don't know what it's like to be me. You, went, you didn't go through what I've been through. It's easy for you to say, you're God's son. No, he knows exactly what you're going through. He is a representative of you to the utmost of every single human being that's ever lived. That's why. At the same time as being a representative of God with all of God's strengths. Imagine that. One man having all of those weaknesses at the same time as having been asked by his father to stay perfect through it. Through the entire 33 years of it. What do you like when things are going well, brothers and sisters? And you've had enough sleep and things are ticking along nicely, got a nice job, marriage is going okay, kids are doing all right at school, got some income coming in, got a lovely house. Things, things are ticking along quite nicely. You can sort of manage sometimes to live a perfect life. But what about when the wheels are falling off? What about things are going haywire? What about if you lose your job or you lose your home or you get terminal sickness? Or your children leave the truth. Or your partner leaves you. What about when it starts all going pear-shaped? Imagine, here's the Son of God being asked to stay perfect when all these problems were coming his way. So, so have a look at all these quotes, brothers and sisters. And, and now just think of the power of those quotes and think of the 33 and a half years that they had to be accomplished in. He was made perfect while he was suffering. He was obedient even unto the worst death possible while hanging on that cross. Stayed obedient. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. See how God's being represented in the one, sen in the one part of the sentence and you and I are being represented in the other part. 
He was made sin for us who knew no sin. And that comes from our reading for tonight in 2 Corinthians 5. He had to have both the sickness and the cure in one man. I think it's just powerful. I just think, you know, do it for a week, do it for a month. But 33 and a half years? That's why this is a marvellous victory. Now, when would it happen? Well, we won't turn this quote up here. Time's slipped away. We've got two more slides. Romans 5, and Uncle John would make this point quite powerful as well. Romans 5 says that God, in due time, allowed Christ to die for the ungodly. At the very peak of human history, when man was at its worst, Jews were at their worst, their, their most narrow-minded legalistic views were being displayed with their superior attitude, and the Gentiles with their most broad-minded liberalism, with their debauchery and their depravity and their corruption, right at that moment, that's when Christ died, when mankind was at its worst. And then finally, where would it happen? Well, we'll leave it here for tonight and pick it up, God willing, next class. But uh, we know that this battle, this fight, this struggle took place over 33 and a half years by a man, Jesus Christ, living in the land of Judea. But the main crucial battle, the ultimate battle, took place in a garden called Gethsemane. And it culminated this battle on a cross on a hill called Golgotha, of which both are just outside of the city of Jerusalem, which Julia's been sending us all those photos of. So you get a bit of a picture of that now. But let's leave it there, brothers and sisters, and God willing, we'll pick it up and have a look at these things and see the moral force behind them in action.